Dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to Congregation of God's People on this sixth Sunday after Pentecost. Welcome to Rutgers Presbyterian Church, Church of Open Commensality, which means that our embrace is open to everyone regardless of your age, regardless of your gender, regardless of your race, your orientation, or any other human distinction. You are welcomed here. This is a safe space to, to worship God and to be welcomed in a community. In this service, we will uh, include an intercessory prayers and uh, we are trying something new. I will be going around the congregation with a microphone if you have an intercessory prayer, something to mention in a prayer to God. Indicate by raising your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Uh, if you are worshiping with us online, there are people uh, on Zoom and live stream. We will be picking from Zoom, uh, like in a chat box or however it's called. Uh, put your prayers there and I will be checking it uh, when we come to that part and include that in, in our prayers as well. And I think that if you have fans, we have here in the back, those who sit in the back, you might not have enough circulation of air. We put all the fans uh, right here in the front. So uh, that is a gentle encouragement for those uh, who want to sit forward and be cool. Otherwise, we have a paper fans. Uh, I'm a big fan of Radgers Church, and you can use it uh, also. Um, so these announcements after us. Uh, uh, I, I will uh, welcome you with the words apostolic of greeting. Uh, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And join me in our opening prayer. Come into our lives, Jesus. Help us to be faithful listeners. Help us to be faithful servants. In all that we do, may we welcome you and serve you as disciples. Amen. And now please join me in our prayer of confession. 
which is taken from a prayer against patriarchy. Let us pray. Creator God, you made us. You know how gender shapes us, how expectations cramp our dreams. Hear our prayer for those who cannot see how gender rules the chain us, how sexism values men over women. Help us shape our world, changing laws and attitudes, challenging churches and political systems, supporting those who don't conform, encouraging each one to chart their own course. Help us create a world where we can live, valued and cherished who we are. And now, if you are able, I'll encourage you to stand up for the words of insurance. God hears all earnest prayers and grants you with divine peace. Amen. Amen. And dear friends, after hearing about God's forgiving grace, so let us now turn to one another with greeting of peace. Peace of Christ be with you. And also we are turning to those who are with us. Peace be with you, peace be with you everybody. Peace. Peace be with you all. Peace everybody. Peace to everybody. Hello everybody. This is Ethel. Hey Ethel. Peace Ethel. Hi. Hi. Right. Uh, yeah. I know. Peace, Beth. Peace. Cool. <laughs> Peace to everyone. Peace. Peace. Peace for everybody. Nothing. We are so happy and lucky that we have you here and you are making these kind of, making yourself scarce. Come here, we can sit on these steps and I want to talk to you about what you had in Sunday school. I overheard that a little bit, but I'll have a completely different take on it. Huh? Okay, so. Justice is a boy, and Jean-Luc is a boy, and Pastor Andrew is a boy, and we love to play with different toys. And I have here some toys. And what do you like most playing with, Justice? Uh, Baseball. Uh, Yeah, of course, Jean-Luc. Uh, you gave me a lovely toy you made yourself when I visited. Am I right? Do you remember what it was? Yes. Yeah, what was it? I have it still on my coffee table. It was a Pi boa. Boa, python, yes. I received a lovely snake. <laughs> yes, and we have their book about spiders, but guys, Normally, boys like to play with this kind of thing. Am I right? Just look. Oh, it runs far. Yeah, I will bring it back. Uh, 
This is a garbage track. This is marvelous, you know. And then girls normally are supposed to play with this. Am I right? Like dolls and other things and making them sleep and feed and cook. There, there, there is nothing more. There are just pencils. <laughs> you know, but I needed these two toys because they are supposedly telling us who likes what. And I can tell you, because I had one year younger sister and a cousin who was a girl who was one year older, and every summer I spent with them, and they played with dolls, and I loved playing with dolls as well. Well, imagine that now I have granddaughters, and especially the youngest one, Isla, she likes trucks and loaders and bulldozers and these kind of things. And that tells you that, you know, regardless of whether we are boys and girls, we like to play with toys regardless how they are being pitched for us. Am I right? And for instance, I know just this, that you love playing baseball. Am I right, Carl? Yeah, you are going this afternoon. You might be leaving early from the church even for that. So... We're not going to stay for the whole time. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying, exactly. You are not going to stay a whole boring time in church. No, we'll try to make it interesting. But there are boys' leagues and there are girls' leagues, and they are playing more or less the same game. You see, and swimming and so on, that is exactly like that. So it is great that we are boys and girls, but at the same time, we should not let other people tell us what we like. That is the main thing I'm trying to make today with you. And if you like to play with dolls, it's all right. And if girls like to play with garbage tracks, it's still all right, because those are just our personal preferences. Oh, of course, and crayons and markers and, and pens, that's for everyone, regardless. Am I right? And so let us now pray uh, together and give God thanks for who we are. Yes, you are there on a, on a projection, just look. Yeah, but let us have a prayer now. Turn to me. <laughs> let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that you have all different people with different likes and tastes, and that we can like toys we like, regardless of what other people think about it, or what they are pushing into our hands. And we are thankful for that. You are free for everyone and giving that freedom to all of us. Amen. And I'll play you as you go back to your pew. You can go. just want to preface this by saying Sophia, a name you'll hear a lot in this anthem, is the Greek word for wisdom. So just keep that in mind.
She lives, she lives, Sophia lives today. She lives and works throughout the world to show the peaceful way. She lives, she lives, we hear her urgent call. We work with her to change the world. She lives within us all. We join Sophia wisdom to take down every wall. Her open doors of welcome, including one and all. We spread her fullest blessings to people everywhere. Her gifts of peace and justice for all to share. She lives, she lives, Sophia lives today. She lives and works throughout the world to show the peaceful way. She lives, she lives, we hear her urgent call. We work with her to change the world. She lives within us all. Sophie, wisdom blossoms, a tree of life and love. Her glory shines forever within us and above. We claim her glorious visions of new reality. A world where all can flourish, where all are free. She lives, she lives. Sophia lives today. She lives and works throughout the world to show the peaceful way. She lives, she lives. We hear her urgent call. We work with her to change the world. She lives with. I hope Sophia lives and reigns because we need her. The scripture lesson for today is taken from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42 from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, 
which will not be taken away from her. So ends the reading. So dear friends, the early Christians were a radical bunch. More radical than many people even today can understand, accept, and appreciate. Just listen and look to evangelist Luke. He was a radical feminist. I mention it in my Friday message because Luke included in his gospel a number of unique passages which were about women as their main character, like this particular story. It is not included in any other gospels, synoptical gospels. You know, we have many stories which are three times in the Bible. This one is unique. Not only that, Luke was even more intentional about it. He created what I call parallels, matching stories about men and women, placing them side by side. And so in Luke's nativity stories, we have Mary's Magnificat, that famous hymn, matched with Zacharias Benedictus. In childhood, when a little Jesus is, according to Luke, brought to Jerusalem to be presented in the temple, that's Luke's creation, but then there is an old Simeon pronouncing a blessing over the little Jesus. But it is matched by prophetess Anna right next to it. And then healing, first healing is a demoniac in Capernaum. And it is matched with rising or healing of Simon's mother-in-law. That'll be in another synoptical gospels. But then we hear about Jesus healing on a distance and a centurion Roman soldier's servant. And it is paralleled with the rising from the dead as son of a widow of nine. And then in parables, it is Luke who parallels the parable of a lost sheep with a parable of a lost coin where the woman lost a coin and then like a housewife sweeps and until it, she finds that lost coin. Imagine God like a housewife with a broom. I preached about it once. I even had a broom behind the pulpit. <laughs> because I like it. You, you know, it's so irregular and so beautiful. And then stories, juxtapositioning, uh, justified tax collector who is praying in a temple for forgiveness. And it is paralleled with persistent widow who is going after unjust judge over and over until she receives justice. Again, a unique look and story. And then we have lists. Of course, there are lists of apostles, of disciples of Jesus with whom he walked through Galilee and Judea. But then, Luke has his own list of women disciples. In chapter 8, Jesus took his disciples and also women who were going with him and whom, of whom many of he healed. And then they are listed. Mary named Magdalene, or Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Husa, Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing from their own resources 
to support Jesus and his disciples. Now, think about it. Women feeding, caring for, and even financing that entire operation early Jesus' ministry. We used to have, in Czech Republic, in, in our country, men's, uh, being visited by a bunch of youth from Prague. And when they came, let me tell you, that was an operation, you know, when something like 15 kids uh, or young people came, and, and just cooking for them and caring for them and preparing everything for them. That was a big thing. Or if you have a youth camps or something like that, you can appreciate that is a big thing. And here you have at least 12 adult disciples of Jesus, Jesus himself, and probably some other people around. And here are women caring for them and financing it. Very interesting detail and insight, peculiar just for Luke, but very likely quite close to what was an historical reality. But that was, it seems, to be the case in the early church afterwards also. Because we hear about Apostle Paul and Lydia, for instance, in Thessaloniki or women in Philippi. And that, then we, in early church, there were those pseudo-epigraphal writings, for instance, Acts of Paul and Tecla. Those were very close collaborators. Definitely early church knew about it. I'm not saying that those were not legends. Of course they were legends, but those legends were built upon reality on the ground. But then, with all of this, women caring for Jesus, his disciples, and then accompanying Paul, there could be a common misunderstanding, quite widespread, that women are caregivers while men are church leaders. And to fix this stereotype, Luke gives us our story of Martha and Mary. You can hardly imagine how much has been written about Martha and Mary and comparing them and spiritualizing and allegorizing them. Or alleg oh yeah, allegor allegorizing. Yeah, making that into allegory. Now let me describe it that way. Uh, like that one represents an active form of faith and the other one the contemplative spirituality or one is justification by works which would be Roman Catholic Church and the other one is justification by faith alone which will be Protestants of course Luther would like this uh, as a social and political activism over against quietistic piety Yes, all of that has been presented. These articles, books, and sermons always end up like high school philosophy essays, I would claim, uh, with banal cliché, eventually finding that we need both active and contemplative spirituality, works as well as faith, activism as well as piety. But that is completely false result from this story. F completely false conclusion from this story. And also completely toothless when you think about it. And sterile. This story is about gender roles. I insist on it. And is best read with the preceding story about men. I preached about it last Sunday. It was Good Samaritan. Do you remember? Good Samaritan, there are those uh, priests and Levite walking by that guy who is uh, on the side of the road, seriously injured and not paying any attention. And only 
Samaritan goes by and takes care of that person. And that one is a neighbor to that person who was seriously injured by the robbers or bandits. And that way, if you compare this story about Martha and Mary with this story about those men of cloth, you know, priest and Levite, then you realize how radical this story about Martha and Mary actually is. Because it's overturning common gender stereotypes in both of those stories. The powerful religious men, priest and Levite, are criticized and undermined, frankly. And I preached about it last Sunday. And the Good Samaritan is lifted up. And he tells us men could and should be caregivers, friends. And then is our today's story about Martha and Mary, showing us quite powerfully that women could and should be free to listen and to learn and to study and be religious leaders. It is quite close to what we later received as Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the right for education of everyone, including girls, including women. Men should be empathic enough, have the feeling for the suffering of others, like that Samaritan should be caregivers, and women should be allowed to study and be religious leaders. It is as simple as that, rejecting petrified gender prejudices, rejecting gender stereotypes. That is what this story is about. It is not pitting activism against pietism. It is asserting men should be caregivers and women should be students and theologians and leaders. Frankly, it goes all the way to Jesus. Luke only lifted it up. He only highlighted it in this powerful way. But Jesus clearly cared about and lifted up girls and women around him. Jesus trusted women. And Mary is here a type of a female disciple, student, theologian, and church leader. And it was so for first three or four generations in the church. But then it got unfortunately eroded and got lost. And for centuries and centuries it was lost. Radical Reformation trusted women, Valdensians in Italy and in southern France, Hussites from my background among the Czechs, women played important roles, at least in those early stages of Reformation. Lutherans and Calvinist Reformation was a more timid, but at least insisted in proper education for women. It took centuries until women were ordained in our Presbyterian tradition. Margaret Ellen Towerner was ordained in Cayuga, Syracuse Presbytery in October 1956. In my Czech denomination, two women were ordained in 1953, three years earlier. But, you know, in centuries, what it is. And the first church I actually served as a vicar. I served and I followed one of them. Eva, Reverend Eva, was 
my direct predecessor on that pulpit, together with her husband. But that's not all of that. There were actually occasional examples of women taking over and leading churches. In my tradition, which is more familiar to me, it was Reverend Ruzhina Opochenska, who graduated from seminary, married and church minister, but in between the wars, first and second war, was allowed just to be a Christian educator. But then, in 1941, her husband was arrested and imprisoned by Gestapo for being involved in resistance movement against Nazism. And she took over and led the church. I was unable to find out whether she was officially ordained. She was ordained if not officially, then by that horrible circumstance in which they were forced to live. And then I realized that's not the only situation. An underground Roman Catholic church under communism had, for instance, married priests and even married bishops. In my church in Prague, I welcomed and in behind our pulpit, and I think that even we concelebrated the communion together and married Roman Catholic Bishop Jan Konzal. And in that underground church were also several women Roman Catholic priests. Should we call them priestesses? I don't know. And after the collapse of communism, the hierarchy and curia in Rome had a big problem suddenly. What to do with them? And John Paul II, the Pope at that time, of course, loved them for being anti-communists, because he was so strongly anti-communist. But his conservative streak was greatly challenged by this nonconformity. You know, married priests, married bishops, women priests. In the end, Roman Curia decided that these priests were irregular, they were illicit, but valid, and allowed them to keep their status until their deaths, but did not allow them to serve, unfortunately. But, you know, we don't need to look at those high churches like Roman Catholic Church or Orthodox Church, which would not ordain women as well. But there are still Protestant churches. Many fundamentalist and evangelical churches are, in an essence, misogynic. Even churches and denominations under Presbyterian or Calvinistic banners, some of them right here in our city and in our neighborhood, Presbyterian Church in America, here known as Redeemer Presbyterian Church, are in fact these kind of hypocrites Finding their true nature and agendas is not that easy. They are very pious, but would not ordain women as ministers, elders, or even deacons. They created a category of deaconesses. If you want to know who is who among the churches, really a very easy and quick survey, just check an ordination of women, <laughs> and that'll tell you a basic leaning of that denomination. And this conservative, anti-biblical and anti-Jesus positions then 
influence and permeate or spread into politics, courts and laws, as we have unfortunately seen just recently in the ruling of the Supreme Court. I am happy that these started to ordain women in 1953 or 1956. It came late, but came nevertheless. And our denomination, my cradle denomination, and my adopted, or where I have been adopted, Presbyterian Church, only benefited. Jesus indeed trusted women. Our denominations learn how to, that decade, decades ago, now we need to persuade all the dark-minded, blockheaded, and stone-hearted people around. We can do it by ordaining women, like we do. And I've been blessed by having Laura Jervis as a parish associate, and that we ordain here in, for the ministry of this church, Ashley, and there were many other ordained women in the work and ministry of this church. That is the best way of not, you know, using our fingers and pointing at them, as I did, and my apologies for that, but sometimes it needs to be spelled out because people don't recognize that. But the best way is actually being joyfully who we are and doing that without apologies or without any hesitations. And that is the ministry and a beacon of this church in this place, even in as progressive and liberal place as New York City. Among the churches, it is still important. Amen. And now, please, if you can, join me by standing uh, in our uh, affirmation of faith, which is taken from the brief statement of faith of Presbyterian Church USA. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere, everywhere the giver and renewer of, of life, who inspired the prophets and apostles, rules our faith and life in Christ through scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the water of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries, ministries of, the of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Savior, Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace.
we praise your name for Miriam, who sang triumphantly while Pharaoh's wounded army lay drowned beneath the sea. should sing that hymn more often. And now for the presentation of tithes and offering. If you would like to make a contribution to Rutgers Presbyterian Church, please consider mailing in a check to the church office. Or if you prefer to give online, please consult the instructions found in our weekly emails or the PDF of the bulletin. If you are worshiping right here in the sanctuary, there is a basket on the right side on the, not a basket, it's a plate on the right side on the table as you leave. Praise God from whom fruits of the earth, the work of our hands, and the gifts of our hearts, O God. And with them we bring a yearning for justice, a passion for good, and a commitment to do your will. May our words and our works help to declare your goodness, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And short words of announcements. Uh, I think they are not mentioned in the bulletin, but uh, we always in this time of the service go over the schedule for the upcoming week. Uh, on Tuesday, we have resistance bureau meeting. On Thursday, there is a uh, Thursday night meal program here at the church. And next Sunday, the children's Sunday school is at 10 o'clock and then worship at 11 o'clock. And today, just like next week, 
at 12.30 roughly or after service, uh, we will gather in the session room for a discussion about the uh, situation, what we can do for those who are uh, affected by the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling and what we can do as a church. Uh, join us uh, in that meeting uh, in the session room in person or stay online uh, for that meeting on Zoom. Uh, that is And now we continue with our worship with uh, intercessory prayers. And if you have any prayers you would like to include into our pr prayers together as a congregation, please let me know and I will bring a microphone to you. Uh, our response is, uh, if it is a petition, uh, Lord, in your mercy, and response is, hear our prayers. Or Lord, in thanksgiving, uh, hear our prayers. Are there any prayers here? Oh, you are shy. I have a long list, yeah, but uh, I see, yes, please. My prayers for Norm and Joshua, who are battling cancer, and for my mother, Gloria, who's Mm, maybe in long COVID, we don't know, but she's 97. Yeah. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Oh, yeah. Neil, I'm coming. Um, for my partner, Bailey, who is hopping in a car in 36 hours and moving the 17 hours by car to Denver, Colorado this next week. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. And I will try to check the chat. Do we have there? Oh. There is uh, from Christine prayer for all women who are no longer able to access reproductive care in the United States. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we continue praying for all those persecuted by rules, who wield their power unjustly and those harassed by enemy action. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For girls who are not allowed to attend school and to study, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all women persecuted for their gender, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For role of religion plays in bigotry, misogyny, and all sorts of prejudices, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all the states, societies, and religions who deny women and girls their universal human rights, praying especially for Saudi Arabia recently in the news, for Iran, Syria, for Afghanistan, and for the United States of America. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For the churches, Roman Orthodox, for all those conservative Protestants who keep girls and women in prejudice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. But also we pray for many brave women who struggled 
in church and society for equality, education, professional growth, answering their calling. Lord, in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. For faithful service of many million ministers, presbytery executives, presbytery and general assembly moderators, Lord, in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. We pray also for those many places around the world where people suffer, women and men, because of the war and conflict. We pray for Sri Lanka. We pray for Ukraine. We pray for Sudan and Yemen, for Ethiopia, and many other conflicted and painful places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for those close to our home here, in our circle of love, for those who are ill or who are overcoming illness or surgeries. We pray for those who are recovering. We pray for all those whom you entrusted into our love and care, now mentioning them in our quiet prayers. Lord, in your mercy and in thanksgiving, hear our prayers. And now, together we pray, gracious God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so, dear friends, rejoice in every Mary you come across. 
and as well in every Martha. They are so wrongly pitted against each other, as I try to point out. It is to empower all those who are marginalized, ostracized, and put down by prejudice and bigotry, starting, of course, with women, but not stopping there. Let us now hear and appreciate, take within and take with us the Lord's blessing, empowering us to live boldly and proudly our lives of faith. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. The Lord shower you with favor and give you peace. Hallelujah. Amen.